Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, my name is Charlie, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Charlie. I'm pleased and grateful that I was asked by Chrissy to uh, speak at this uh, event today. And, um, you know, as Teresa said, I haven't always been active in AA, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And uh, I'm just grateful that I'm back in the middle of it instead of out on the periphery. So um, I do have a sobriety date. It's November 19th of 1986. Um, I was 18 years old when I got sober. I do have a sponsor that has not always been the case, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, the importance of sponsorship. Uh, and I do have a home group, uh, and my home group changed a number of years ago to the Fellowship Group in Huntsville, Alabama, and I'm very pleased and grateful to be a part of that group. Uh, that group uh, does a tremendous amount of service and uh, focuses on the primary purpose of AA of uh, carrying the message to the still suffering alcoholic, and I'm really pleased to be a part of that. Um, you know, what I'm supposed to talk about is what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like now, and so I'll try to do that in a brief way. Um, I grew up in Huntsville, Alabama. My parents moved there for these for the uh, space program. Uh, my dad was an engineer, and uh, so we moved there in 1964, and uh, my mom still lives there, and. Uh, you know, I grew up, we're on the way over here, and, and uh, we're talking about upbringings and, and families, and and I was hearing the story of this awful childhood and growing up, and I was like, my childhood was not like that at all. You know, my childhood was, you know, my parents were the cleavers, okay? Uh, my parents are not alcoholics. My sisters, I have two sisters, they're not alcoholics. Uh, which makes me think maybe I'm adopted, but I'm the only alcoholic in the family that I'm aware of. Uh, so that's kind of that's kind of a little different story than some of the others that I've heard. Um, my parents were loving and kind and supportive. My dad was always there for baseball games and soccer games or whatever I was involved with. Um, growing up, I was involved in competitive swimming, which. You know, it's a little different than the normal sports, uh, but in competitive swimming, uh, it's very intense. Uh, you have to swim all the time. Uh, I swam year-round, um, swam before school, after school, on the weekends, so I had to get up most mornings at 4.30, which is a little different than most kids. They don't like to get up that early, but I had to. You know, that was part of my training. Um my goal in life as, uh, growing up was I wanted to go to the Olympics, and I worked very, very hard at that. I uh, also wanted to get a college scholarship in, in swimming, and, and I was well on my way of doing that. Um, but, you know, before I get too far in that story, um, you know, growing up I learned to lie at an early age. I learned that, you know, if you lie, lots of times you get away with stuff. And even confronted with things... Uh, I would always lie to try to get out of things. Uh, and I don't know, you know, my sisters weren't like that. I was the only one in the family. It's like I'm the black sheep of the family. I don't understand why that was, but if something went down, I was going to lie about it to try to get out of it. Um, you know, I always wanted my parents' approval and just never could quite measure up, it seemed, in my own mind. You know, people on the outside looking in, would probably say that I did, but in my own mind, I, I never could quite measure up. Uh, I recall that um, in fifth grade, uh, this is kind of a story about honesty. In fifth grade, I, uh, me and this other kid got into some fifth grade trouble, whatever fifth grade trouble is, and the uh, teacher called, called the class together and said, hey, who did this? And I remember this kid in the middle of class stood up, and he raised his hand, stood up, and said, I did it. And I just couldn't believe it. this fifth grader, you know, just standing up in the middle of class and saying that, you know, owning up to it, being honest. And, of course, I sat on my hands. I didn't say anything. I, you know, I was not about to stand up and do that. But I always wanted to be that kid. You know, I always wanted to be that guy that could stand up 
and say, I did it, and I'm sorry, and that that's the thing. But I never could quite get myself to do that. Uh, you know, that went along with the whole honesty thing. Um, I had my first drink in uh, freshman year of high school. Um, when I got to high school, I went to a very large high school. My graduating class was 650, so it's a very large uh, high school. And... When I first got there, it was a little overwhelming, but because I swam competitively, I had these all these built-in friends from freshmen to seniors. And, uh, you know, they kind of helped me along. In the high school, they had these pod systems that are very confusing, like, okay, well, you go to the A pod. Well, who the hell knows where the A pod is? And they pick on freshmen because nobody knows where they're going. So uh, the older kids really helped me to acclimate to going to high school. And so, you know, one of the first weekends of school, they said, well, hey, we're going to go out to the hockey game, and uh, we're going to drink some beers. Would you like to go along? And, I, of course, I want to go along. And uh, they asked me, I said, well, what kind of beer do you drink? Well, hell, I didn't know. I mean, I said, well, whatever you guys want. Uh, and I remember, I remember taking that first sip of beer, and it tasted like, urine. I mean, it tasted awful. I didn't hate, I hated it, but I was not, I was going to be a part of, so I continued to drink. And after two or three, that really started to taste pretty good. And, uh, I really liked the effect. And from then on, I drank for the effect. I didn't drink because I liked the taste of alcohol. You know, I drank because I wanted to get drunk. And every single time I drank after that time was to get drunk. And I didn't really understand why people would drink if they didn't want to get drunk. I mean, that didn't make any sense to me. And still this day, after all this time being sober, I look at people drinking. I go out in social situations. I see people holding on to their beers or their glass of wine, and they'll drink half of it and leave the rest. And I just don't understand that. That does not make any damn sense at all to me. Uh, because I was going to drink until there was no more alcohol left, and then, by God, we're going to get in the car and roll and get some more. Um, that's just uh, how I operated. Um, you know, freshman year, I started to, you know, drink every, every weekend and any time I could get a hold of it, I'd drink and, um, but, but each time I did get drunk, um, sophomore year, uh, became really kind of Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, and then maybe during the week a few times. Uh, so it really kind of escalated my sophomore year. Also, I know this is an AA meeting, but um, drugs are a big part of my story, and they allowed me to get to AA faster. You know, they led me down the scale a lot faster than if I had just been drinking. Okay, I found marijuana at a very early age of my uh, freshman year and, you know, did lots of cocaine and LSD and you know, it led me down the path just a lot faster. But since this is an AA meeting, I'll, I'll keep my talk to uh, alcoholism. Um, my swimming had really gotten good by this time. Um, my freshman year, I was top 10 in state in all, all events I swam. Sophomore year, I was top 5 in all events that I swam in state meet. Uh, my junior year, I was undefeated throughout the year in all events and got gold medals in every event that I swam in state meet. So I was really on my way. Um, uh, by this time, uh, again, this whole line to my parents, you know, they'd go out of town, I'd throw a big party, and it didn't matter what I did. You know, I'd have people park down the street, bus them in, whatever. I would always get caught every single time. Without fail, I always get caught. And my junior year, I qualified for this very big uh, swim meet in Syracuse, New York, uh, Junior Nationals. It was a national meet, and I qualified to swim in it. And this was really, this was really the pinnacle of my swimming career. Because if I did well at this meet, then there are college scouts there, and you know, then I moved to the next level, basically. And so I qualified for this swim meet, and it was in Syracuse, New York. And the month before I was, uh, no couple weeks before I was supposed to leave, uh, parents, of course, went out of town, and of course, I threw a party and got in trouble for it, and my dad told me, he said, I, I cannot trust you anymore, uh, and I can't trust you to go off to this swim meet, and I was devastated, 
he said, I'm not going to send you up there. And of course, being the manipulative alcoholic, you know, I begged and pleaded and talked him into it. And, uh, he finally agreed. Uh, well, the rest of the swimmers went up, say, on a Monday, and it was all week. My event was not until Friday, so he let me uh, – my event was Thursday, so he let me fly up on Wednesday, okay? The night before I was going to leave, I had uh, – uh, my friends called me from Syracuse, and they said, you're not going to believe it, but there's a bar across the street. This is downtown Syracuse. There's a bar across the street that will – let us drink, and we're getting hammered every night. And, you know, I told them, and I knew in my mind, I said, I'm not going to drink. I'm there for a purpose. You know, I'm there to swim. I'm not going to drink, so forget about it. You know, my dad took me to the airport. The last thing out of his mouth was, whatever you do, don't drink. And those words kept ringing in my ears over and over again. And I knew in my heart I was not going to drink while I was up there, and I was focused. And I'd worked, you know, all my young life for this particular moment. Uh, I was off the plane, and within an hour I was in that bar. And I got so we got so drunk that we stole the team van, and we went across town to Syracuse University to drink pitcher beer. I don't know why we did that, but uh, they were all over Syracuse looking for us, and we were hammered. We got so drunk there that we came back and went across the street again to drink a little bit more because we weren't drunk enough. I was so drunk I was vomiting in the bar. Uh, I got back to the hotel room, and the coach came in and found us, passed out in our own vomit. And uh, he didn't know if we were dead or alive. We had drank so much. And so... He called me into his room, and we sat down and talked, and he said, Charlie, I think that you have an alcohol problem. I think you may be an alcoholic. And in looking at that situation for about a minute, I thought, you know what? I think he's right. And then my mind started thinking, okay, how the hell am I going to get out of this one? And then I stopped thinking about myself as an alcoholic and started thinking about how I'm going to manipulate my way out of this. Because I knew I was in trouble. The jig was up. Uh, I swam the next day horribly. Uh, shocker, you know, I'm still hung up, probably still drunk. Um, swam horrible. Um, it was awful. Awful. And I knew I was in deep, deep trouble when I got home. Uh, when I got home... My dad had about it, and he was, well, he was not very happy. He was a very large man, 6'5", 280, and uh, he was very angry. He he was so angry driving home that he pulled over the car and stopped and stepped out and said, I want you to step out, and I'm going to whip your ass right here on the side of the road. He was very angry. And, of course, I locked the door and said, I wasn't getting out for the life of me. But, you know, there's a picture of my parents um, – in 1984, okay, and they, you know, my dad still had hair and dark hair and, you know, no gray showing and happy and joyful and vibrant, and in 1986, there's a picture uh, of them sitting on the back deck, and they're both gray, my dad lost most of his hair, and they just look haggard, you know, and that's because of my drinking, they had no idea what to do with me. No clue. Uh, so, I don't know how, I, you know, I just let it blow over. Uh, my senior year, uh, I started drinking every morning before school. Uh, I was drinking during swim meets. Um, and my swimming, you know, was still okay, but was not like it was my junior year. And I, I had shoulder injury, and it allowed me to quit allowed me to quit uh, the sport that I love so much that I wanted for my life, and it allowed me to step out. And at that point in my life, I wanted to drink more than I wanted to swim. I wanted to drink more than I wanted to compete. So my swimming career was open over my senior year. And my dad was devastated because, uh, you know, the commitment that I had going to workouts in the morning and in the afternoon was – just my parents had just as much commitment. Hell, they were driving me most mornings, 
And, you know, they're there traveling all over the southeast to swim meets and beyond. And, and they had put a lot of time and effort into helping me to achieve these swimming goals. And so I told my dad, I said, I, I don't want to swim anymore. And to his credit, he says, Charlie, whatever makes you happy is I'm, I'm happy for you. And so I got, uh, so I graduated and I went off to uh, University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa. And uh, I, went, I went a week early because they had rush week. I was not going to rush a fraternity, but I want to get a jump start on the party. Because in my mind, that's what I want to do. I want to go down there and I want to party. And that was what I was there for. Uh, and that's exactly what I did. I went out down there. Uh, I think I went to classes for maybe two weeks. And then they got in the way of my drinking and partying, so I stopped going to classes. You know, my life consisted of waking up about four in the afternoon, drinking and partying until dawn, and then sleeping till four in the afternoon every day. And uh, I was miserable. You know, I was depressed, I was miserable, but I could not stop that cycle. I could not stop that cycle of drinking and partying. You know, I'd try to control my drinking. I'd say, well, I'm only going to drink a couple, or, you know, I'm going to, or I'm not going to drink tonight, and I'll drink anyway. And it was absolutely miserable. And I, I knew, I knew I was going to be in trouble. You know, my dad's paying big money to me to go to the University of Alabama. And, uh, you know, I didn't have to work. He paid for everything. And I spent all that money to party. And, uh, you know, I used to tell everybody I was an alcoholic. That's how come I can drink so much. And I kind of chuckled about that and laughed. And it was funny until it stopped being funny. Uh, and I stopped being funny. And I was miserable. Um, when I got sober, I weighed 150 pounds. That was a few pounds ago. <laughs> uh, but I didn't eat. I drank. I used drugs, and that was it. Um, November 18th of 1986, uh, alcohol stopped working for me. I couldn't shut off the whatever was going on in my head. I just couldn't do it anymore. Uh, and I drank an enormous amount of alcohol and could not. I couldn't get to where I wanted to go. And that was complete oblivion. That's what I wanted out of drinking. So, you know, I, I think I called, my sister was down there at the University of Alabama, and I hadn't talked to her once as I've been down there. Uh, you know, my old sister. Uh, so I called her because I was lonely. I had this complete aloneness, and I just couldn't shake it. You know, I was surrounded by people, but there were people like me, you know, that partied and would use you for whatever they can get out of you. And, you know, it was just awful. So I called my sister, and I just wanted to talk, and I didn't want to talk about anything but just talk because I was lonely. And this has been this was my first spiritual experience I ever had. Um, I picked up the phone, and she answered, and this power came over me. And it's the power of God. The power came over me, and all this honesty started spewing out of my mouth. Stuff that I would never tell my sister. I mean, exactly what was going on. And she says, what do you want to do? I said, I want to get the hell out of here. I need some help. So she came over, and when I hung up the phone, it was like this, you know, this feeling like, what in the world just happened there? Because that was not me. I'd lied so much that I lied about things that I didn't need to be lying about. And, you know, my dad used to tell me, you'd lie even when the truth would do. And that was me. I mean, I'd lie about everything. So she comes over and she says, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I, I got to get the hell out of here. I'm packing some stuff and I'm leaving. And uh, came home and, you know, my mom, bless her heart, she's June Cleaver. She, you know, she didn't care that I wasn't going to classes. She didn't care that, you know, I'd gotten arrested and I had some legal problems. Uh, she was just glad I was home. She was glad I was safe, and she was glad that I wanted to get some help. And, uh, you know, my mom, bless her heart, she's been that way her whole life. She still is that way. Um, 
My dad, however, was a little different. <laughs> he was not very happy to see me, knowing that uh, I hadn't been going to classes and that I'd been arrested. And uh, but you know what? My dad and I worked through that. Um, they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to send me to treatment or whatever. And somebody told them to send me to this uh, counselor. So I went to this counselor and, uh, you know, gave me this big, long test, MMPI or whatever. It had about 500 questions on it. It was, it was long. And the, the main thing he got out of that is he says, well, you know, you're an alcoholic and drug addict. I said, that's a shocker, Doc. I mean, yeah, I know that. And he says, well, you might want to consider, uh, I went to another 12-step fellowship, uh, NA first, uh, because, you know, the drugs had let me down the road a little bit faster. So, so I went to this meeting, I, I knew this girlfriend in high school that, I don't know what the hell she was doing hanging out with me, but she was going to meetings and hanging around me, partying, that's it, but, uh, she took me in my first meeting, and, uh, you know, those people were talking about their feelings, and, you know, what they had done, and I just felt so a part of. I felt like this is where I need to be. This is where, this is where it's happening. So, you know, God is, God has been, God has protected me in my recovery. He's re protected me in my alcoholism, but also in recovery. I can't tell you how important it is to have a sponsor. Because for me, when I first got there, I would have just been fine going to meetings and looking at girls and, you know, doing this, that, and the other thing and, and not working the steps. And I've seen that. I've been around a long time, and I've seen people do that, and they always, always get drunk. Always. That first meeting, this girl said, you need a sponsor. I had no idea what a sponsor was. I, I thought they were going to start giving me loans or something to kind of catch me up. But uh, she said, no, this guy's not going to give me a loan. Uh, so she says, you need to go ask that guy right there. And he was this roughneck from Boston. God, I couldn't understand a word he said. Uh, but he said, uh, are you willing to go to any length to stay sober? And I said, absolutely. Well, I didn't really know what that meant. But at the time, I was totally honest and thought, oh, I'll do whatever it takes. Because I was, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was sick and tired of living that life. I wanted something different. I wanted to be that fifth grader that could stand up and say, I did it. You know, that's what I wanted out of my life. And, and I just could not find a way to get there. <clears throat> so he told me to go to 90 meetings in 90 days, and I did that. And I went, you know, I didn't have a job or anything, you know. So I was going to meetings every day, and uh, he started me on the steps. He started me on the steps. And the meeting – and. The other thing that he did was he started taking me to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. Uh, the first meeting, it's funny, the first meeting I went to was the fellowship group, which I'm a member of now. And I remember, the only thing I remember was, in NA at that time there were some young people, but I went to the AA house and he and I were 18 years old. And the next youngest person was about 40, which I thought was ancient. I thought, oh my God, this guy's, these people are so old. They cannot possibly understand me. And I listened to what they said, and I had the same feelings as these old people, you know? I mean, this is what I'm thinking in my mind. I'm like, what? How do they, how do they know how I feel? I mean, and they told me to keep coming back, you know? And that's just something that an adult has not, didn't tell me for a very long time. They did not want me around. And they certainly didn't want me around their daughters, so. Um, so they said, keep coming back. We want you over here. So my sponsor started me, uh, I will say my first year of recovery was awesome. I mean, so awesome. Uh, I know everybody doesn't experience that, but I'm so grateful. I, I feel so grateful for that fact. Uh, God removed the obsession to drink and use early. Um, and I had a sponsor that took me through the steps relatively quickly. In fact, you know, we'd done the first three steps and I was comfortable and sitting back and going to meetings and, you know, looking at girls. And I thought, okay, well, this is, I'm feeling good. And so I kind of rested on my laurels and sat on my ass and didn't do very much. You know, I was going to meetings and doing this, that, and the other thing. And he says, okay, it's time to do a four step. And some of the people that I was kind of, 
relating to had been a long time and they had not done a four step and they kept talking about how awful it is and how, you know, whatever. And my sponsor said, we're going to start doing your four step. And I said, uh, it's not time yet. I've only been sober, you know, a month and a half. And they said, he said, you're going to get your ass over at my house in this little Boston accent. Uh, Saturday morning at 8 a.m. Don't be late. And I was a little scared of this guy because he, you know, he drove a Trans Am, had a leather jacket, and he was pretty tough. So, uh, so by God, I showed up at 8 o'clock, and I was not late. And uh, he sat with me all day long. And this is what I needed. This I, I did not need somebody to say, here's a notebook. I'll see you in a couple weeks. He sat down with me all day long and helped me to write my four step because without that, I would not have done that. Uh, I would have procrastinated, waited till the last minute, and it would have been some, you know, half-assed four-step. And so he sat with me and answered every, you know, think about that. I don't, would I be that patient with a sponsor? I don't know. He sat with me literally all day long and asked, answered every question that I had. And I got through the majority of it. And he says, all right, I'm going to give you two weeks. If there's something else that comes up, you write it down, and then we're going to do your fifth step. And went on the mountain, and uh, I went over that stuff with him. And in the fourth step, there, there's a third column, you know, kind of like, what's your part? And I, I didn't know. I had no what, I had no insight into that. The only thing I could get past was, this person did this to me, and this is what it affected. And the third column was blank. I didn't know, have any idea. So he sat with me and went over and explained to me what my part was on each and every resentment. And I needed that because I had no insight whatsoever. I had a spiritual awakening that day. I mean, not everybody experiences that doing a fifth step, but I did. I mean, I just felt like the heavens had opened up. That, And not that there was anything crazy on my fourth step. It was just that Finally, I was completely open. I was not lying to people. I was not lying to myself. I was completely open. And what a great feeling that was. Um, in my first year of sobriety, uh, there were not a lot of young people in AA. And so we started a young people's group in Huntsville. And it was kind of a glorified get-together is really what it was. I mean, we... We didn't collect, but maybe a couple bucks every meeting. And, but we got, but it was important because we got together. My biggest fear in getting sober was, what in the world am I going to do? You know, what in the world am I going to do? You know, I'm 18 years old. Everyone else going out having a good time, and I'm, I'm locked into this boring, glum life of having to trudge to meetings and do this, that, and, that. and then this just wasn't the case. You know, I had so much fun. You know, when I was drinking, there was all about three things that I did. They all included getting hammered, passing out, puking, driving somewhere, hoping I wouldn't get DUI. Okay? That, that's really all that happened. All right? I was kind of stuck in this thing here. Well, so, okay, so I, I get sober, and the whole world opens up to me. You know, I can do all kinds of things, because I'm not, I don't have to figure out, okay, where am I going to get my alcohol? Because, by the way, I haven't had a single drink of legal alcohol ever. All, all illegal, under 18. So where am I going to get the alcohol? What am I going to do? And so now my world is open to whatever, whatever, the world. And uh, what a great feeling that was. And I felt so free in that first year. Um, when we went through the third step, you know, growing up I always had a connection with God. I went to church, you know, I believed in God. But near the end there, I... I felt so awful about myself. I didn't really think that God, I, I didn't think God really cared about me anymore because I was not a good person. Um, and then my sponsor explained to me, you know, that's grace. That's what grace is about. That's what forgiveness is about. And that helped me a lot. My, my, I grew spiritually that first year. I can remember finally going out beautiful spring day like today and everything feels clear the air is clear it feels less dirty it feels it just was wonderful you know what a wonderful first year that was um my first year oh at our young people's meeting 
we weren't as organized as you guys. I mean, we didn't go down to Birmingham and do stuff like that. I mean, we just got together. And we, our basic need that we met was we had a place to meet that young people could come and we could be together. And that was it. You know, we didn't do it. That's the only service work we did. We didn't take meetings out of Birmingham like this and have Cirque Pod and Alcune. We didn't do any of that stuff. But we did get together, three of us, my sponsor included, go to Boston for an Inky Pod convention in my first year. I think I had Six months. Okay, so this Hickey Paw convention was in Boston, Massachusetts, my sponsor's uh, hometown. So he wanted to go up there, and I was begging to fly, and he didn't have any money, so we had to drive. So we drove all the way to Boston with this guy that was nearly sober. And by the time we got up there, we wanted to kill this guy because he was really controlling. Well, anyway... We got to the Icky Pot Convention, which was just awesome. I mean, thousands of young people. Uh, it, it was just amazing. I, I, in fact, it was a little too amazing. It was a little overwhelming for me. Being six months sober, I was overwhelmed by all that stuff. And uh, it's kind of a funny story. The guy that, it was his car that we went up in. He kind of disappeared after the first day, and we didn't see him for the whole weekend. And we're like, where, where is this guy? You know, what, what's happened to him? And he, he wasn't staying where we were staying, and we just didn't see him. And then Sunday rolls around, and Sunday night, and we're thinking, well, we got to leave in the morning. Where is this guy? And he finally calls us Sunday night and says, I picked up two people, two young friends off the street of Boston, and I'm bringing them down to Huntsville with me. So he picked up two street people, and he's going to bring them down to Huntsville with him to stay with him. Because they're his new buddies. And uh, by the way, he didn't go to the convention. He went up to Niagara Falls or whatever. Obviously, he'd relapsed. And uh, it, we're like, I, I don't think that's such a good idea. And he says, I'm going to do it. If you want a ride, we're leaving tomorrow morning. If not, you can find your own ride. And we said, well, we'll find our own ride. So we looked at airline tickets. And, of course, the night before, they're astronomical. So we took a bus. I'll admit, I had post-traumatic stress disorder from that bus ride from Boston to Huntsville. It's 36 hours straight. Well, not straight. You stop every hour. But 36 hours on the bus. And they never give you enough time to actually go someplace and get something nice to eat. You know, you got to eat vending machine food. So every hour, and plus back then you could smoke on the buses. So we're smoking nonstop. Uh, not, didn't have our toothbrushes. Eating vending machine food, I, and I, literally, I wanted to kill my sponsor when I got back because, well, I mean, not long with anybody on a bus, you'd want to kill him, but we didn't talk for a whole week after that. <laughs> but, you know, we had lots of adventures like that. We went to, you know, we'd just hop in the car and go to meetings here or there or elsewhere, and it was just awesome, you know, it was so great. Then, uh, you know, I'd gone to school and failed in my mind. And I decided, you know what, and I tried doing some jobs, and I thought, well, I don't really want to do that. You know, I want to go back to school. So I went back to school, and uh, I was really fearful of doing that because I had failed going to school. And, you know, my dad was very supportive, and my sponsor, and everybody was really supportive. I said, well, listen, just go take a couple classes and just do your best and see what happens. And, you know, frankly, that's what I did until I graduated. I just kept taking classes until they told me, you don't have to take any more classes anymore, you've graduated. I mean, that's how I got through school. And graduate school, same thing. You just take, I, you know, what's in front of me, okay, I don't worry about the, you know, four years that I have to take. Okay, this semester, what do I have to take? Okay, what when do I have to go to class? <laughs> all right, and that's all I did. And then I graduated, you know. So, so I went back to school, and, you know, my dad was able to see me go back to school. He was able to see me get my life together, and, you know, my relationship with him was mended. You know, I was able to go back and make amends for those wrongs that I had made. And I went, it was, uh, it was January 7th, uh, after I had a year sobriety, uh, and 
my sister's car had broken down and it was a water pump issue. And I'd always help my dad with the car. And so he was going to change out the water pump. And I, it was a Monday night, and I was supposed to go to this meeting that I always went to on Monday night. And I said, well, Dad, I can hang back and help you out uh, if you want. And he says, no, I know those meetings are important. I'm really grateful that you're sober, and I think you should go. And so I went to the meeting, and, you know, it's a regular meeting. And uh, I came home, and there were police cars all in the uh, driveway and ambulances and uh, fire trucks. And uh, when when I got home, um, the car had fallen on my dad and killed him. And my life changed. Uh, I walked in the house, you know, my family's crying and weeping. My mom had found my dad and uh, it was awful. It was awful. And uh, my sponsor and his sponsor came over that night, and my house was filled with AA people telling me it's going to be all right. And I had no, I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. I couldn't imagine my life without my dad because my dad had always guided me in my life, and, I, you know, I was lost. Uh, that whole week, um, you know, my house was filled with AA people and family, you know. And I think back on that time and my mom saying, you know, these P these AA friends of yours are really good friends. And I was like, you're right. You're right. Um, that year, during that time, it snowed, I don't know, 13, 14 inches. I mean, it's a huge amount of snow. And we had to delay the funeral until people could actually get out. And people still were not getting out when the funeral came, but it was standing room only in the church. Um, and that's what I want, you know. My dad was the kind of guy that people believed what he said because he told the truth. And he was an honorable man. And that's what I want out of my life, you know. I used to, I used to hate my dad for making me do stuff. But I see now what, I see now what he wanted. You know, so my life did change. I went off to school. Excuse me. Went off to school at University of Georgia, and uh, you know, at that time I had about three years sober, and uh, I wanted to be normal. You know, I had not. You know, I was 21 years old, and I just wanted to be a normal guy. I wanted to. Be, you know, I went to meetings because I knew I had to, but I had really stopped doing a lot of service work. Uh, you know, I think when you have about three years sober, you've heard everything you need to hear in AA, or you don't hear everything you need to hear, but you hear everything you think you need to hear. And, you know, I'd worked through the steps, and I'd done everything, and I was like, you know, I got this. So... I keep remembering my first sponsor telling me the goal is to be restored to the mainstream of living. Well, I took that a little bit far. <laughs> so I'd really, I went off to the University of Georgia and I'd stopped going to meetings. Uh, I was going out to clubs with people on my, you know, that I was rooming with. You know, I was a 21 year old, so I could buy alcohol for them. So I'm buying alcohol for these roommates. I mean, you know, how sick is that? So. Yeah, I just wanted to be a normal 21-year-old. And I thought in my mind, you know what? I just won't drink. And I got so sick. I mean, I did not drink, but I got so emotionally and spiritually sick. And I go to, like, what I call uh, crisis meetings. And so every 30 days or so, I'd get so sick that I'd go to a meeting and feel great. And then I wouldn't go to any meetings for another month. I mean, it was just sick. Hell, I even pledged a fraternity. I mean, what sober alcoholic in AA is going to pledge a fraternity? I mean, that's just crazy. And so I told them, I'm like, well, I don't drink. And they're like, we don't care, you know, whatever. So uh, here I am, the sober alcoholic hanging out at keg parties. And uh, I just got sick, really sick, until I finally said, I, I cannot do this anymore. And so I started going to meetings regularly, and I got involved. I got in the middle of things. And I found out, man, there's a lot of young people that go to college at big universities. And we started a young people's meeting. And we hung out together. 
And I had that normal life, but with sober alcoholics in AA. It was awesome. You know, I see some of the people that are involved in the Alcupa thing and the young people's group. And, you know, it just, that that's how my life was. I mean, we hung out together, we went to concerts, and we traveled, and we did stuff, and it was awesome. Uh, I still go on hunting trips once a year with the guy that I was in school with at, in AA. And uh, what a great time. Great time. And I'm so grateful that God got me through that sick time to get into the great time. Um, came back, well, how much time we got? Gotcha, thank you. Alright, so, um, I'm going to breeze through a couple of marriages here. <laughs> we'll breeze through that. <laughs> uh, my first marriage was, uh, I was 25, and this is typical alcoholic stuff. All right. So I'm 25 and decided, okay, it's time to get married. So whoever I was dating at the time, by God, they're my, they're, I'm getting married to that person. So I got married, and my best man told me the day of my wedding, said, that's a mistake, Charlie. And I said, but we've already bought the cake. So I got married anyway. <laughs> and that lasted about two years and probably should only last a year. So uh, came back to Huntsville. I had an opportunity to come back from Georgia to Huntsville. And, you know, each time bad stuff happens in my life, I recommit myself to AA and get back in the middle of things. And it all turns out okay. That's been my history. You know, I mean, it's like I'll kind of fall off the the beam a little bit and kind of get away from AA and then, you know, some bad stuff will happen and then I'll get back in the middle of things and then, you know, my life gets better. It is always, without fail, for 25 years, if I commit myself to AA and do what I know I need to do, my life gets better and I grow spiritually every single time, without fail. So I come back to Huntsville and... uh yeah. You know, I was active for a little while, but again, you know, I just kind of, I don't know, I had 10 years sober and thought, okay, you know, I'll lax up a little bit. And, you know, I was working on my career and I had gotten remarried and, you know, I thought, okay, well, I'll go for a couple times a week, once a week or whatever. And, uh, and I didn't have a sponsor at that time. That's another thing. It's even 25 years sober. I have to be accountable because my mind is so sick. I can rationalize any kind of sick behavior that I come up with, you know, and that's what I did. Uh, you know, I went a 10 year period where, you know, I'd go to meetings once a week or whatever, didn't have a sponsor and my character defects just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And I was acting out on these things and I was hurting people and I was miserable. You know, I've always believed in God. Um, Near the end there, I would gotten so far away from any semblance of spiritual growth that I really questioned the existence of God. Um, it was, you know, it was awful. It was awful. Uh, I hurt people. Uh, I got divorced because of my behavior. And uh, it's been a struggle making that amends to my ex-wife for my behavior. Um, it's, been a, it's been a struggle. So, in 2008... I redoubled my efforts and came back. I mean, not that I had gone, but I, I really had been on the periphery. So I came back and redoubled my efforts, and I've been to a meeting almost every day since then, since October 2008. And my life is, I feel so happy today in my life. I feel so fulfilled. And that's that's a direct result of Alcoholics Anonymous. Working the steps, being part of the fellowship. You know, my life is so great today. Um, yeah, I was thinking that just the other day. I mean, I'm single, you know, I'm in the middle of AA, my, my career is great. Um, I'm closer to God than I probably have ever been in my life. And I'm in the middle of service work now. You know, I'm treasurer of my group at home. That's a pain in the ass job sometimes, but... But it's service. It's service to my AA group. Uh, I sponsor people now. Um, you know, I'm very grateful for my sponsees. They keep me sober and they keep me green and they keep me in the middle of things. 
because uh, if I'm not, I'm in the old old farts league. You know, I'm over there, not you know, just like telling everybody how great I am. But I need people in my life to tell me that I'm not that great. You know, and I have that, and it's it's awesome. It's an awesome <clears throat> feeling. So, um, I just want to give you all hope. Uh, I did not do everything right in AA, but God relieved the obsession to drink, and I keep seeking God. And God keeps helping me to grow spiritually. And I'm hopefully becoming the man that my father always wanted me to become. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.